Okay, so what we're going to do um, is you can either paint along with me or you can just simply listen to the lesson. Um, tonight's lesson, we're going to be doing just a simple still life, but I'm going to show you all of the things that watercolor can do. Watercolor is a medium that quite a few people are, are afraid of because they've heard bad things about watercolor. But watercolor is quick. Watercolor is not hard. Watercolor follows the path that you give it with water. So if you don't give it a path, it's not gonna go where you don't want it to go. Tonight, we're gonna use some table salt and we'll also use a hair dryer. Um, the hair dryer, of course, is always optional, but I use it just to dry things quickly. So um, first off, we're gonna put in a little bit of a light background and we're gonna add some texturing with our salt. So the background is going to be put in with a large brush and just plain water for now. Because the, the cherries are gonna be much darker in color, than the little bit of watered down black that we use for the background, you can go right over that. It's not going to matter at all. But as I said, the watercolor does follow the path of the water. So if you don't want your um, background colors to go on your banana, which I do not, then I'm not painting my banana. I don't care if it goes on my cherries because my color of my cherries is going to be much darker. So I'm just wetting my paper right now with plain water. And I'm going to use some watered down black to drag through just for a little bit of texture and also um, just to make my background something more than just plain white. So you wanna water your colors down well. That's why it's called watercolor, so that it's watered down well. And I'm dragging my brush through and I'm just simply creating some additional color so that my background is not pure white. I don't want it to be, you know, a, a pure white color. And then what I'm going to do is where I put in that little bit of water down black, I am going to throw on some salt. And you're probably saying, well, what will salt do? But salting adds a little bit of texture to the color because where it lands on that paint, it has a chemical reaction to that paint and it causes um, the paint to model a little bit. So it kind of gets uh, a texturing through it. And it's always nice for like a tablecloth or for the fruit on skin or anything like that. It, it just adds a, a great little bit of texturing for you. Now you wouldn't want to use it if you were doing a flesh tone or something like that, but it's great on uh, if you're painting to make it look like wood, or if you're painting to make it look grassy, um, any place that you want a little bit of texture. We're gonna let that sit for a minute to give the salt a little bit of time to react. And then just for the sake of our time this evening, I'm gonna dry it quickly with a hair dryer. okay? Um, while I'm doing that, um, I want to give you a little bit more explanation on your watercolor. It's always best to work with more of a watery color than to try to use your watercolor to make it look like an acrylic or an oil paint. Your watercolor is translucent. So you wanna add as much color as possible because, or as much water as possible because you want to keep that nice, clear, translucent color. You can layer watercolor, which is something that you can't do with your acrylics and your oils, but you can layer your watercolor. So if you find that you've painted something and you don't feel it's dark enough, you can put another wash on. The key though is to wait for your 
uh, washes to totally dry. If you try to add a wash into your coloring that you just put down and it's not dry, you're going to get what's called a wash back which that water will then push that paint out of the way and almost create uh, like a bubble effect in your paint. Now, maybe that's something that you want to happen and that's fine and good, but most of the time it's not. So I'm gonna just real quickly dry this so we can move on. Okay, now we're going to start with the banana. Um, there is really no rule as far as if you want to start with a dark subject versus a light subject. The only time that really applies is if you are working with additional colors on one subject. So if my banana was yellow and dark green and brown and orange, I would start with my lightest color. But because it's really just yellow and uh, brown, has some brown spots, then my yellow is going to be my first. My cherries, they're different because they're dark in color. It would not matter if I did a cherry before I did my banana because those two colors are not on the same object, okay? So I'm going to be painting my banana first and I'm going to be using both a light cadmium yellow as well as putting in some yellow ochre, which is more of a, um, a medium kind of goldish tone. My light yellow goes on first. And you want your paint to be nice and wet. Again, I can't stress enough that it's called watercolor for a reason. You want your watercolor to be nice and wet because two different things, three different things. We're going to be adding some things in and we want them to have a nice blend. They won't have a nice soft blend if your paint's not wet. Because as I said before, your paint has to follow a track and that track is water. So if you're not wet, then it has nowhere to go. So while it's wet, I'm going to go into my yellow ochre, which is that little bit of a darker golden kind of yellow. And I'm going to just add a little bit of extra color in this banana so that it's not all one perfect color. Now I'm also going to add in a couple of those really ripe little brown dots. You know how your banana gets nice and ripe and then it forms those little brown dots, which sometimes people think that your banana is then spoiled, but that's when it is perfectly ripe. So I am using some of my brown. There's many different kinds of brown, but this brown is, um, is a, uh, called umber, burnt umber. And it's probably one of the most common browns. I'm putting a little tiny bit of black into it just to make it a little bit darker. And with a very fine brush, I'm going to just dot in a couple of those really ripe dots. My banana is going to be super ripe. Nothing better than a great, good, yummy, ripe banana.
The other thing that you want to remember too, especially with watercolor is because it's translucent and because you can um, layer some of your colors, I always say less is better. You can always add. So you can add dots to your banana whenever you'd like to, but taking them off is much more difficult. So you wanna make sure that you don't overdo right off the bat. Do a little bit, step back from it. If you're happy with it, leave it alone. You can always add, but it's very difficult to take away. So I'm gonna let my little brown dots settle for a minute or two before I move on. And I'm going to um, dry that also with a little bit of my hair dryer. I'm gonna add in a little bit more of my darker yellow down in here. and then we'll dry. Now, for those of you that are aware um, as to what salt does, um, I don't, you don't have to, you know, look at this, but I'm going to hold this up closer so that you have a better idea of what salting can do. Can you see that? Can you see those markings that um, are made from the salt? That's all a texturing that the salt will done. And that will do. And it really just adds to an area like a tablecloth, like I said, or a, something cement, something wooden. It's a great tool for texturing. Now, before we move on to the cherries, um, you want to take a good look at your banana. Is there something that you want to add into it? I'm going to put in just for the sake of showing you transparency and layering, I'm gonna put a little bit of green up here at my stem. So I watered down my sap green a little bit and I'm just putting it up at the stem. Now I don't wanna have a hard edge like that. So I'm rinsing my brush and I tap it off on a piece of paper towel and I just run it along the edge. And then when you run that along the edge, you get a nice soft blend to where you have your additional colors. If you wanted to put in a little bit more brown, maybe down at the tip of your banana. And the same thing, if you don't want that hard edge, you wanna rinse off your brush and just soften that edge with your brush and that'll give you a nice soft edge to it. If you are looking for a hard edge, then you certainly wouldn't do this. But if you want a nice soft edge, then you wanna do that. Wet your brush, dab it off on a paper towel and then um, soften the edge. You may have to soften it more than one time. It depends on how much paint you put on or how much you want that edge to disappear, okay? So now 
we're going to move down to the cherries. All of the cherries are basically going to be done the same, but I will I will do one at a time. And if you are working along with me, just watch the first couple steps and then you can go ahead and do your cherries. I'm using a dark blue called indigo blue for my cherries and I'm mixing it with a little bit of a uh, rose color. Now you can use rose matter, you can use alizarin crimson, any of those colors that will give you a little bit of a reddish tone to your cherry. You can use cadmium red also. Um, it depends on uh, sometimes red mixed with your um, indigo has a tendency to look brownish colored, which we don't want that to happen. But you want to mix it in so that you get a nice, um, it's not purple, but you get like a bluish purple color to your cherry. Okay. And we're going to paint our whole cherry with one wash of that. And then after we're done with that first wash, we will go back in and add some additional colors. Because again, what we can do with this is we can layer our colors. I'm not going to paint the stem. I'm just painting the cherry because my stem is a nice light green color. So I don't think that this purplish blue color would cover with a light green. Be nice and wet when you're putting your paint on. You don't want to try to stretch your paint. Don't try to paint your entire cherry with one brush stroke. Use your paint, use your watercolor. That's the purpose of um, watercolor being so easy to work with. You're just adding a little bit of water and you can have your paint ready and waiting. Now, while it's wet, I'm going to add in a little bit of extra red and you can do that wherever you want, but I'm going to add in a little bit of that extra red right here just to give my cherry a different color. And I'm going to be adding in a little extra plain indigo over here. And we're going to let that dry. If you look at your picture, the reference picture that was sent to you, you will see that that cherry also has some highlights on it. A little bit of whites, a little bit of blues. Those will come on at the very end. I'm going to move on and I'm going to paint my next cherry. Now, you don't want to paint wet against wet because then the wetness from this cherry will just blend right over to this cherry. So, in order for me to paint this one, if I absolutely want to paint this one right this minute, this one has to dry. But since I'm fortunate and have another cherry over here, I can just hop over to this cherry. The only way I would not be painting this cherry is if my banana was not dry, because I certainly wouldn't want my cherry to be leaking into my nice yellow banana. We can also tell you that tonight's painting um, lesson is recorded. So uh, if you want to refer back to anything, um, it is recorded. So you can refer back 
and see exactly what you may have missed or if there's something that you didn't do that you want to do and you're not sure you don't remember then that would be the time to do that Okay, now of course this one is still wet. So I'm gonna wait for a couple minutes, let that paint sit in, and then I'll I'll use my hair dryer and hurry it along a little bit so that we can paint this one. Watercolor paint is technically just a dye. And so because it's a dye, um, it stains the paper um, with, with some oils and some acrylics you might be able to wipe them away, but you can't do that with watercolor because the paper is actually pressed rag. So when that paint hits the paper, it's staining the paper and it's not going to give that color back. Now, if you just put something down and it's really wet, you may be able to blot it up, but nine chances out of 10, because the paper is rag and the paint is a dye, um, it's going to stay on your paper. I prefer, just for some general information, I prefer the tubed paint versus caked paint. It's all a personal preference. I like the tubed paint because it will, um, it will moisten itself right away when you add water to it. If you're working with a cake paint, you have to wet it, wet that cake over and over and over again to pull that paint to be nice and liquidy for you to use. So it might be that I'm just impatient, I'm not really sure, but I like for my, um, paint to be ready and waiting for me. Now, that doesn't mean that your tubed paint stays wet in your palette, but all you have to do is add a little bit of water to it. My paper preference is I buy paper by the sheet, not in a block and not in a tablet. And again, it's a personal preference, but the reason that I buy paint in um, sheets is because they are not pressed as firm as a block or a tablet. So they retain a little bit of their absorbency when you put your paint down. Sometimes if you're working on a block, a watercolor block, or if you're working on a watercolor tablet, you'll see that the paint has a tendency to puddle. And that's just because the absorbency is not quite as um, good as the single sheet paper. So, but it's all personal preference. The single sheets come in sheets that are 22 by 30, and that gives you four pick four pieces of paper this size. You just fold it and tear it. And of course you can keep it larger or you can make it smaller also.
Now, as you can see, watercolor will dry slightly lighter. So if you feel that your color that you put down, once it was dried, it got too light, you can redo it. You can do exactly what we did prior, putting on that little bit of indigo, putting in that little bit of pink or red, and you'll get a darker tone. You just want to be careful that when you do that, that your original paint was dry first. You don't want to try to put it on if this is still damp. Okay. Okay, so now we can finish this third cherry. Be nice and wet. You don't want your cherry to be drying before you get it all painted. Because what if you want to add in some red or if you want to add in some indigo? If it's already drying, then you're going to get brush lines. You don't want that. You want your color to be nice and wet so that it'll have a soft blend all the way around. It's always better to be a little bit too wet versus a little bit or a lot too dry. So you want to make sure that you're nice and wet. Shadows and highlights come on at the very end. So you don't want to try to do any shadowing or anything until the very end. Because The reason for that is because you don't know how your colors are going to blend yet. You don't know how your colors are going to dry yet. So you don't want to worry about shadowing or highlighting until it's all finished. The other thing is you can't highlight um, with white until the very end because then if you choose to put another color on, you cannot. White will not accept a color on top of it. So you have to be very careful um, about putting your highlights on and wait until the very end. That's the best time to do it. Okay, so while my cherry is drying, I'm going to go up here and put in my little bit of a brown stem on my banana. And I always try to keep my reference pictures close by to refer to them. There's nothing wrong with referring to your pictures while you are painting. That's the purpose of them, really. He's painting upside down, Jean. <laughs> you can stretch this picture. Don't tell too many people that. They'll think I'm crazy. <clears throat> and I'm going to paint that little bit of a um, core at the very end of my banana while I'm into my browns. And I'm also going to do a little bit of dry brushing on my banana. Now, dry brushing is when you take your brush, preferably a round, you're going to dip it in your paint, and you want your paint 
to be liquefied. You don't want to dip it in the straight paint. You want your paint to have some water to it. You can dab it on a paper towel so that it's not too wet. And you're going to drag it down the portion that you want to show um, a broken painted line or area. So I'm going to show that broken painted line down the bottom of my banana. It's not solid. It's broken because there's not a lot of paint on it. And also because I'm using the side of my brush. So I'm going to make a couple bruises on my banana. Oh, Marcy? Yes. Um, someone is asking if they can, uh, if, if, if it would be possible for us to see the palette. Sure. This is my palette. Okay. I use, um, you know, some people put all their reds over here and all their greens over here. I try to do that, but then when I get newer colors or different colors, then I just put them where something is open. I don't clean my palette either. I cleaned it tonight only so that Mark would think I'm a really neat painter, but I don't clean my palette. And in all of my classes, I will yell at you if you clean your palette, because if you are all finished painting, your next painting, you're probably going to use brown and you're probably going to use some of these colors that are on your palette. So I never clean my palette. However, if there's something that you need to have a clean space for, I do allow you to clean a space on your palette. But don't clean your palette. You're just wiping up all that good paint that you could be using for your next painting. Okay, so I'm going to just go back to um, doing a couple more little bruises on my banana. And this is just done by dry brushing. I'm just dragging the brush sideways back and forth, however I want it to look. And giving my banana more appeal. Oh, appeal. That's funny. Okay, so my banana is going to be almost finished until I do some shadowing later. My cherry, just the cherry is finished. We're going to be doing the stems yet. And then we're going to be working on some shadows and some things. So what I want to do next is my stem. My stem, I'm going to start off with a sap green. Nice and wet, but I'm going to have my burnt umber or my blue ready because while my stem is wet, I'm going to go in there and put in some brown and some blue. Painting my stem and I'm going to paint it all the way down into my cherry. And while it's wet, I'm going to go into my brown, my burnt umber, and I'm going to put a little bit of that burnt umber just with the tip of my brush in to the top of the cherry. And you'll see how it's going to start to flow down the stem. And I'm going to put a little bit of blue in the middle of it. That's just changing it so that it's not this perfect green line all the way down my paper, okay? I'm gonna let that dry. I'm not gonna do this stem yet because this one is wet. However, I can do this one. You might be asking why I painted over the stem with my yellow. My stem is going to be light green anyway, which is darker than my yellow. So it doesn't matter that I painted over it. So 
So I'm going to paint over my stem now that's on my banana. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna put a little bit of brown along the top, just dropping it in while it's nice and wet. And on this one, I'm going to put in a little bit of my yellow ochre on this stem, just to change it up a little bit. I'll, I'm going to wait until these colors bleed and blend a little bit before I try to dry it. In the meantime, I'll give you a few minutes to get caught up. If you're not caught up, get your cherries painted get your banana dry brush to make it look like it's been bruised a little bit, and then we'll move on. If anyone has any questions, please unmute yourself or let Mark know through a chat. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer anything for you. But we'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and get caught up. Maybe use your hair dryer, get things dried, and then we'll go ahead and move on. Hi, this is Alice. I was just wondering, is there a particular salt that works better than others? You know, some people will say that, you know, they only use kosher salt. Other people will say that they only use the um, iodized, iodized salt. I don't see any difference myself. My personal preference is I use any salt that's available. Sometimes I take it off the stove. Sometimes I, you know, use the salt that's packed in my bag. You don't want to use a real fine ground salt because you do want to have your little salt uh, pieces that you can actually see because that is what is giving you the texture. If you use a really fine salt that's almost like a powder, it's not going to react in the same way. So you can either use a coarse salt or just your regular table salt. Okay, thank you. Sure. I, I wanted to ask if there are particular brands that you recommend, because I'd like to get some good, you know, invest in some paints that are that Sure. Are um, if you are a beginner, yeah. Um, or even an intermediate watercolor painter or even advanced because I, I still use them myself. I personally prefer the Grumbacher brand, but I also like Windsor Newton um, and I use them pretty much. I would say 70% of my paint is that. Um, I also use uh, Richardson paint. Um, because they have some unique colors that I like. And then of course that takes you into a whole new realm of, well, do you use black and do you use white and do you use tubes of paint that are already orange um, instead of mixing red and yellow? Mm. It's all your personal preference. You know, I've had um, some people tell me you should never use black. You should try to mix your own. And I have tried for 30 years to mix black and I never get black. I get something that's maybe close to black, but it's more mud colored. Um, uh, when I use black, I want black. So I buy black and I use black. Other artists and watercolors, people that are much more talented than I, say you should never use white, that you should leave your paper white where you want it to remain white. Well, that's fine and dandy, but I also don't have a lot of patience. So to continually paint around those same little white areas that I want to remain white, I would be throwing my paint brushes out the window. So I use white where I want my highlights, I also will use a masking agent called Miskit. 
Um, if there are some real fine things that I want to keep white, um, I will misk it them. If I'm doing fur on a pet portrait, I might misk it some of the fur to keep it white until I'm ready to put a color on it. And misk it comes in a bottle. It also comes um, in these real fine bottles that have a real thin tip on them. I'll see if you can see the tip over here um, that your misket comes out on. And uh, you can do real fine skinny lines with that. The only thing with misket is you have to be sure that you close it up right away because you don't want it to dry in those little tiny tips. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like the consistency of a rubber cement. And when you are done with your painting and you're ready to paint those places that you left white, it just rubs off. So um, again, to go back to your question, I like Grumbacher, I like Windsor Newton, I like Richeson, um, but I like tubed paint. I do not like the cakes. It takes too much of an effort to get that you know, wet and ready to roll. And especially if you need a big amount of paint, then it seems like you're rubbing on that, um, you know, that paint cube forever trying to get enough paint. So, but it's your personal preference. If you work on all little small paintings where you don't ever need large amounts of, of paint, then, you know, maybe the cake kind is, is what you're looking for. Um, and I also, like I said, I buy colors that I think are pretty cool. Um, you know, turquoise and, and some different kinds of pinks and different kinds of greens. I buy them in the tube. I don't wanna waste my effort trying to mix it. Um, because again, if you're mixing your colors, um, you're never gonna get the same mix. Your ratio could be slightly different and you're gonna get a different green versus the green that you just mixed 10 minutes ago. So if it's coming out of a tube, you're, you have the consistency of a color too. Thank you. You're Foxy, welcome. There's another question in the chat. Sure. Uh, do you have an art degree or are you self-taught? I do not have an art degree. I am self-taught. Um, Oh, many years ago, because I've been watercoloring for 30 years now, but many years ago, um, I was a director of marketing and I have had two older sisters and I guess they were bored and they decided that they were going to take a watercolor class. And so they insisted that I do that with them. So I did, which was hard because I worked, but um, I took this watercolor class with them and I did like it. And I found it to be much easier than probably most of the people in the class because I was fortunate because I was able to draw easily and it wasn't a big effort for me. So that's how I kind of started. Um, and I did stay with that class. It was both a social class and, you know, an enjoyable class. And then through um, an unfortunate event, we were without a teacher right in the middle of a, of a class, of a course, uh, an eight week course. And they said they were going to cancel the rest of the course unless someone could, you know, you know, step up and teach the class. And the, uh, students in the class voted me in without asking and that's how that's how my teaching of the watercolor began and of course my first few years of teaching with that group was you know you're learning while I'm learning and um but it was a lot of fun but as you know to answer your question I did take some classes um some professional classes but most of my most of my learning is self-taught and by mistake. Many mistakes along the way, and that's how you really learn. Where can these particular uh, paint brands be purchased? Um, I use a, an art store in Squirrel Hill called Artisan Craftsman, and they have 
the paint brushes I like. They have the paints that I like, except Grumbacher. They don't carry Grumbacher. Um, and I don't know of any place locally that sells Grumbacher. So I go online to Cheap Joe's to get my Grumbacher paint. But my um, Windsor Newton paint and my Richeson paint, I get it Artisan Craftsman on Hobart Street in Squirrel Hill. Thank you. And if you go to Artisan Craftsman, if you tell them that you've taken a class through me, they'll give you a 10% discount. And every little bit helps because you know, some of the paints, um, you know, you, you might think it's expensive that a, a tube of paint is like six or seven dollars, but that tube of paint is going to last you a year, um, you know, because the tubed paint, you don't need a lot of it. You need just little dabs. So it'll last you a very long time. Okay, we're going to dry this second stem here. And... Um, paint it, and then we will move on to some of our shadowing and some of our highlighting. Okay, this stem will be the same thing. I'm painting it with my green, my sap green. Gonna add in my little bit of brown. But this time I'm gonna add my brown in at the bottom. A little bit along the edge there. Okay, so shadows are very important in a painting. Um, they give the painting a dimension they have a tendency to lift your objects up where they should be lifted off your paper to make them look a little bit more realistic. So shadows to me are extremely important. The thing about shadows though, is you don't wanna do it again until the very end, because if you put your shadows on before you are finished, you may change something and then you would have to change your shadow and you want your shadow to be all one painted entity. You don't want it to be done in pieces. So your shadows really should be done at the very end when you are sure that you are finished and you have nothing else to do. So I wanna make sure that I'm not going to be changing anything or moving anything or adding anything before I would go ahead and put my shadows on. And of course, to me, I'm not gonna be moving my cherries. I'm not gonna be moving my banana. So it looks like this is where it's going to be. Before you do a shadow, you wanna make sure that all of the salting is removed because you don't want these little salt textures to be in your shadow. You don't want a nice, dark, even shadow to have a couple little white dots through it. So you wanna make sure that all of your salting would be removed. Shadows come in different intensities. Some of our shadows are light, some of our shadows are medium, and some are dark. And it depends on where your object is in the picture. If your banana is laying flat, the part that's lifted off the table is going to have a lesser shadow than the part that is on the table. It would be like my hand. You can see my shadow here. My hand is really close to the paper, so it's going to have a deeper 
harder, more definite shadow. But as I would lift my hand away, that shadow gets less intense and you can't tell the shape of it as much as if it is right down on the paper. Well, that goes for anything else that has a shadow. So I'm going to be doing my shadows in parts. I'm going to do my least defined shadows first, and then I will get my more defined shadows in last. My least defined shadows I put in on wet paper because then that paint will have that tendency to move out a little bit and not give me such a defined shape. So I'm going to wet my paper right up here a little bit. Because this is where I'm going to put the shadow in for the top of my banana. And I wanna wet it way bigger than where my actual shadow will be because I wanna give it the room to expand. So I'm going to be putting my shadow for my top of my banana about right here. And because it's in a wet, it's on a wet area, I'm allowing it to expand. It's not a real definite shadow. It's more of a muted watered down shadow, which is fine. You can soften the edges with that wet brush. And we're just going to let that dry. Along the bottom edge of my banana, I also have a softened shadow right here. There's probably a softened shadow down here, but it's overtaken by my more defined shadow. So I'm only going to do my soft shadow up here. So I'm going to wet that one first also. And anytime you're wetting, your paper, re-wetting it for any reason, you want to make sure that your paper, I'm sorry, your water is clean. Because if you don't use clean water, that dirty water will leave a mark on your paper. And you do not want that. So I'm giving it room to expand. And I'm painting my soft shadow right down here. And I'm going to take it right up to my cherry. I'm not worrying about my cherry shadow right now. I'm just worried about my banana. And I can soften that edge a little bit. Now you can see how your banana is starting to come alive. It's starting to come off your paper. It's starting to look more realistic, which is what we want, okay? My cherry, if I'm just gonna continue to go around, my cherry also has a hard shadow and a soft shadow. It actually has three shadows if you refer to your picture. It has a very soft shadow and then a medium shadow that almost has a little bit of a blue tint to it and then your dark shadow. So I'm going to put in my softest shadow first, which is over here on my paper. And it's just a nice soft oval. And I'll soften that edge a little bit. Now, as I said before, over here, there's going to be a really hard shadow for my 
rest of my banana. So it's kind of redundant that I would go in there and put in a soft shadow only to harden it up with another hard shadow. So I'm just not putting one in there at all. However, on my two cherries down here, I do have a shadow. So I'm going to wet the area around those cherries. Clean water, remember. Okay, now we want to make sure that they're nice and dry before we would go back in and try to deepen any of the shadows. My next shadow would be my medium shadow. And my medium shadow has a little bit of a blue tint to it. So I'm going to use my light blue color, which is a cerulean blue color. And I'm going to go ahead and mix that with some of my watered down black. It'll give me somewhat of a steel gray color. I want to make sure that these shadows are nice and dry. And now I'm going to put my medium shadows in. Now my medium shadows, I'm not going to re-wet the area. I'm going to put those shadows in. And what I will do is rather than re-wet that whole area, I will just soften the edge. So this is my little bit of blue mixed with a little bit of the black, which is watered down. I'm gonna do both of my shadows before I soften. And then to soften, I'm rinsing my brush and I'm dabbing it off and I'm just going along the edge and softening it with that damp brush. It just kind of breaks it up so that it's not such a hard edge anymore. I'm also going to be using that medium color for a shadow on the tip of my banana. 
And again, I don't want to take it the whole way down because it's just going to get covered over with some dark shadow. So I'm going to wet my paper about right here. And that's just going to remind me that I only have to take that color down to about right there. I'm going to soften it. And then I'm going to let that one dry. And then last but not least, I'll come up here and do my last cherry. And if you're wondering and thinking, wow, she really knows where those shadows go. I use my picture. That's the purpose of having a reference picture because you want to be able to refer to that. Um, I could never remember where all the shadows would go unless I had my reference pictures. Um, I use my reference picture from start to finish. Okay, so now we have our two values of shadow in. We're gonna put the third value of shadow in and then we'll do highlighting. You don't ever wanna put your highlights in before your um, shadowing, your highlighting should be the end because you can't put anything over white, okay? So I'm gonna dry this again real quick and then we're gonna put the final shadow on. Your final shadow is going to be with your black, but it's not going to be watered down quite as much. Okay, so now we have our hardest shadows and those hardest shadows are going to be done with your darkest color. So I'm using my watered down black, but I am not adding quite as much water. It's still going to be very liquidy. I'll add as much pigment as I need. Now my stem does not get that shadow over it because that stem is sticking out in front of my shadow. So you don't wanna make the mistake of going over that. Same thing, I'm gonna soften my edge, but I'm gonna use a little bit bigger of a brush now because I have a bigger, longer shadow. So I'm gonna soften it with a bigger brush.
There we go. And then I'm going to move down to my cherry. And then um, last but not least, I will move down to my other two cherries. And I'll soften those. Now, when you soften things, you wanna keep an eye on them because you see how this shadow is getting a little bit rough along the edge. It's still wet. So I can go right back in there and soften that right up. So whenever you're doing stuff, you don't wanna just do it and then go and leave and have a glass of wine. You want to make sure that you're paying attention and that you are watching where your shadowing is, where your painting is, because if you get a hard line, it's certainly not the end of the world, but why do you want a hard line if you can avoid it? So now all my hard shadows are in. You can see how those shadows make your painting look so realistic. It actually lifts your fruit off the table. It makes it look much like it is realistic. And that's not even with the highlights on yet. When those highlights come on, you will be so surprised as to what those highlights will do. Those highlights make everything pop off the paper. Okay, so you wanna be happy with your shadowing before you do your highlighting. There's a little bit of a darker shadow, a very slight one right here. And it's a hard shadow because it's so close to the table. It does not have to get softened. Okay, some are really hard, some are not. And again, referring to my picture, there's a hard shadow here. And don't forget now, you can't have shadows on your table from a light source and no shadows on the fruit. You have to have either all shadows or no shadows. And I never go for the no shadows. So my light source is coming from almost the top up going down because that's where my shadows are underneath the fruit. So my light source is coming from the top. So that means that the bottom of my fruit has to have a slight shadow on it. So for as much as you don't want to do this, you have to put a shadow on your fruit. And I know, especially the people in the classes, they gasp when I do this. But when you see how realistic it makes your fruit, you'll take that gasp back. You have to have shadowing. I'm also going to soften that little bit of a shadow on my fruit.
And we also have to have a little bit of a shadow. Even though your cherries are really dark, they're still going to have a little bit of a shadow down where they are meeting up with a shadow. So down at the bottom of my cherries, I'm putting on a shadow and I'll soften those edges. And yes, you even have to shadow some of the stem. So I'm putting a little bit of shadow on my stem. Okay, <clears throat> shadows are done. Now we're going to do the very last thing that we need to do, which are the highlights. But before I do my highlights, I'm going to add just a little bit more texture in my tablecloth. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's white and I wanna break up, even though I broke up some of that white with my salting and that at the very beginning, I wanna break it up a little bit more but I'm gonna break it up a little bit more by actually showing the texture in the tablecloth, the weave in the tablecloth. And no, I am not gonna do individual little lines. That would take us forever. What I'm going to use is a fan brush, okay? So this fan brush, okay, is going to draw those lines for me. I am dipping it in some watered down black. I'm gonna dab it off and I'm just going to run it down my paper in a couple spots, not everywhere. And then I'm going to run it the opposite way. And that's going to just break up all of that white that was on my paper. And it will give me the impression of a weaved tablecloth without actually having to say it's a weaved tablecloth. The very last thing again is your highlighting. I always keep my white on a separate plate or a separate little dish because I don't want my white to get contaminated. And your white can get contaminated very easily. It can also contaminate your other paint very easily. Once you get a little bit of that white into your paint, then that paint becomes um, non-transparent and you don't want that to happen. So I always keep my white separate. Now, if you are looking at your picture, if you do have your picture to look at, you can see where there is some whiter areas on the cherries. There's none really on the banana, but on the cherries. So I'm going to be using Chinese white Chinese white 
is um, an opaque color, but it also dries very light. So you really have to know the value that you want to put on before you put it on. If you want just a very slight highlight, which I do along the bottom of my cherries, then you want to put it on very lightly. If you want an intense marking, then you need to put it on very intense. So I'm going to show you the difference. Again, you want to make sure everything is nice and dry. And this will just take a few seconds and we will be done. When you are using your white, you wanna do it with clean water and you wanna put your white on, especially if you're putting it on more than a little dot here and there, you wanna put it on with as few strokes as possible because you don't want um, to mix it and make it look like it's an orchid purple or something. You just want a light wash and this is going to dry way lighter than what you think. So don't get all in a tussy there. It's going to dry much lighter. So I'm putting this little highlight on. It's kind of making my cherry, um, you're able to see the reflection now of the white tablecloth, okay? I'm gonna do the same thing on my other ones. They have a little bit of white um, shadow on them. I mean, white highlight, I'm sorry. And I am just looking at my picture. So what I see on my picture is where I'm painting my white highlight. I'm also going to soften the edge on this one. Okay, and I'm going to do the last one here. Okay, and you can see how light they're drying, which is what I want. I didn't want a big high intensity highlight on them. I do want a high intensity highlight on the little dots that I'll be putting on. And those little dots are what is really going to make my cherry pop. Going to soften this one just a little bit.
And I'm going to put just a little touch of blue on this bottom one here. Kind of pick up that little bit of a blue shadow that was down there. And you are done. Those little white highlights really bring your picture to life. So we're done. I hope you um, I hope you'll take a few minutes. If you're painting, continue to paint so that you can get it all finished. Um, if you again are not finished, that is perfectly fine. This is recorded, so you can back up, go forward, stop it, watch it 25 times, whatever you'd like to do. Um, I'll open it up to any other questions that you might have. Um, I know we still have a little bit of time left and then we'll go from there. Could, could you say, tell us what kind of brushes you use or what? what... Sure. I like um, American Journey brushes because they have a short handle. I don't know if you can see this, but um, yes. I like a short handled brush because it, to, it's me. I think I have more control with it than one that's, you know, way out here. Mm -hmm. um, so I like American Journey and I get them online at Cheap Joe's. Um, I also like Princeton brushes because they are short handled and they also have um, a uh, almost like a padded uh, handle to them. I like them and I can get those at the art supply store in um, Squirrel Hill. But it doesn't matter what brush you get. Um, it's up to you if you like a short handle or a long handle. I will tell you, do not spend a lot of money on your brushes. Um, now don't get cheap brushes and you have to get a watercolor brush but you don't need a sable brush. You don't need squirrel hair. You don't need any of that fancy stuff that you know they're gonna tell you your brushes are gonna cost you $400. You do not need that. Mm -hmm. um, you can use man-made whatever, as long as it's a watercolor brush. And you really shouldn't be paying, I think I paid like $6.95 for these or $7. You really don't need to be paying a lot of money for your brushes either. I am very hard on brushes. Um, so, you know, I have to replace my brushes like every six months. So I, I don't spend a ton of money on my brushes. And the brushes that you will need, don't let them talk you into 25 brushes. You will never use 25 brushes in your lifetime. I like a number um, six round. I like a number four round. I like a number two round. And then I have a big round, which is like a 16. I have um, a half inch flat and I have um, an inch or a two inch flat. The only other brushes that I use then are riggers and a rigger is a fine liner. And I use a number one rigger and a zero rigger. And that's all you really should need, especially at the beginning. Um, you shouldn't need anything more than that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? That's taking. <laughs> Thank you very much. We we appreciate it. We've got three people here all working on a on a painting. So <laughs> great, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very Marcy much. Thank you, Nancy and the Monroeville Art Council for help to helping make this possible. Yes. Thank you. And we have another one coming up, right, Mark and Marcy? Uh, yeah. On uh, Thursday, and May twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Right. Yep, we're going to be doing these as much as we can. So um, we'll be back again, May. Um, it'll be another easy one like this, not a still life, we'll do something different. Um, and again, you can paint along or you can just watch, it's recorded and then you can paint tomorrow or whenever you want to. But um, 
we'll be doing another one in May.